We are very happy to have with us Alexander Michael Hajiliran, a researcher and a scholar, especially of uh, the Armenian community in Cyprus. And uh, as you all know, um, on Sunday, there is a divine liturgy that is taking place in uh, occupied Nicosia. And um, we would like to use this opportunity to provide some information yes. to, to, the, um, to the new generation, perhaps, or for people who have not uh, been part of the collective memory uh, of, uh, of the church, the school, the kindergarten, the prelature, and generally the life in, in the Armenian community about a half a century ago. What an eloquent way of putting it. <laughs> well, first, let me just say that it's a pleasure being with you. Again. We have been friends for how many years? <laughs> True. So, uh, on the 7th, which is on Sunday, um, we will have a liturgy at the old uh, Victoria Street Cathedral, or and um, this is uh, very important because the last liturgy in 1964 actually took place on the 5th of January 64. Uh, so it's uh, 70 years after the last liturgy took place, 70 years and two days, after the last liturgy took place... 60 maybe. No. Six, oh yes, you're right. Let's do some math. Hello, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually very good at maths. I know that. <laughs> so, um, now, uh, the church that we know now, we can see now, was built between 1308 and 1310 by King Henry II, the Lusignan. Mm -hmm. However, before that, there was actually a church built in 1116. So, and this church was destroyed by an earthquake, mm -hmm. so that's why it was rebuilt. Now, yeah. originally it was an abbey, it was a monastery, monastery. Uh, for the Carthusian and then Benedictine monks, and uh, nuns, apologies, mm -hmm. and uh, some of these nuns were Armenian, uh, specifically Armenian Catholic. Uh, there was Abbess Fimi, which was uh, very well known, uh, and she was the daughter of Hetum the first or the second? I'm not quite sure of this. Um, so uh, it's no surprise that the, the, ab the Abbey came to the hands of the Armenians. And this happened between uh, 1491, where there was, one, there was an earthquake at that year. And after and before 1504, at which time we already know that it was Armenian. So between those uh, 14 years, uh, it changed ownership. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when the Ottomans uh, came to Cyprus and they conquested it in uh, 1570, 1570. 1570. Uh, when they conquered it, they turned the church into a salt store. However, there was a firman that was issued in May 1571 by Lala Mustafa Pasha. A decree. Yeah, who was the Beyler Bay, the Bay of Bays, and he returned uh, the church to the Armenians. Um, now, uh, we know that uh, during uh, that period of uh, about 400 years afterwards, uh, there were several changes. Uh, for example, uh, the Arash Nortana, that's a prelature, used to be where the Melikian house is now, because that Melikian house, previously prelature, was even more previously uh, the original part of the monastery. Oh. Yeah, so it was the church was part of the monastery. Now, then, uh, at some point later, I think this is in the 1700s or early 1800s, um, there, were ch there was somebody rich who had died. If I'm not mistaken, his name was Chovagimara, 
and uh, he gave uh, as a gedak, uh, he bequeathed his land uh, so that the Arachn of Taran that we know now was built and this Arachn of Taran was built in 1789 um, as you enter the entrance uh, as you enter the um the, the area on the right, the compound, yeah. On the right, the area on the right. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, the church itself was restored a number of times, uh, and uh, for example, there was a renovation in sixteen eighty eight, in eighteen eighty four, and in nineteen o four. The nineteen o four one was perhaps the worst restoration because. What they did was they plastered the walls. It was, you know, a common custom at the time. I think they took it from the Ottomans, uh, this custom of plastering the walls. The remnants of it are already there. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that the UNDP Act did when they restored uh, the compound between 2009 and 2012 was to remove this plastering and reveal the glory and magnificence of the Gothic building, you know, the uh, Karashenk, the uh, stone built, uh, you know, with the, uh, with the, those big uh, porous stones. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <coughs> now, in uh, 1921, uh, which is about uh, six years into the genocide, we have the uh, construction of uh, the Melikian school. Now, uh, late 1920, Artin Bey Melikian died, and uh, his request was to uh, give that land and the money for a school to be built. When the school was built, because there was a school previously, there was, uh, the first one was in 18, oh, I'm forgetting. Uh, the first one was in 1870, and then it was restored. Uh, but there, it was a small school, and mm -hmm. there was this was for boys, uh, and it was restored by a uh, an Archimandrite of Artabet called Mamigonian, mm -hmm. and if I'm not mistaken, his name was Vahan Mamigonian. So that's no coincidence. <laughs> and then uh, when Bedros Sarajan came for his first term in Cyprus uh, as a high soup, uh, he built the Shushanian school for girls. Mm -hmm. That's uh, 1903, if I'm not mistaken. But these were small schools and mm -hmm. they were, you know, they were not uh, co-educational. So when the Melikian school was built, everybody was saying, oh, it's in 1921. Oh, it's such a big building. What are we going to do? But the very same and the next year, it was packed with refugees. refugees. Now, uh, then we have <coughs> uh, the Uzunian school building, which was built right next to the Melikian school. And this was built by the nation of Dikan and Tuma uh, Uzunian uh, while they were still alive in 1938. Uh, next to the Uzunian school, we have the Armenian Genocide Monument, which was built in 1932. Uh, this was constructed, designed by Garo Balian, who also designed the two school buildings. And Garo Balian was uh, the architect of the Melkonian. So we're talking about an important figure. Mm -hmm. And this monument, it was the second oldest of its kind in the world. Now, in 1950, we have the construction of the Mangabardes, the kindergarten. Uh, the architect was somebody called Imastun Gulvanesian. Uh, Imastun, what a name. So, and this was actually built, uh, it was during, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the headmaster. He did bazaars and so on. Uh, and uh, they collected money and they built the Mangabardes because previously the Mangabardes used to be uh, right next to the church uh, towards the Arach Nortaran in the middle between uh, the church and the Arach Nortaran. So Gebenlian, I think, was the mm -hmm. headmaster at the time, if I'm not mistaken. 
so um, you know there were other buildings auxiliary buildings and so on uh, and this compound was the center the epicenter mm -hmm. of the Armenian community of Nicosia because there would be houses and businesses of Armenians all around uh, and were, clubs and clubs I was getting to that now uh, as you enter the compound from the side of Victoria Street because there is also another entrance from the side of Notre Dame de Tier Street so as you enter behind you you have the AGBU mm -hmm. club now this AGBU club which was actually made a club in 1957 uh, belonged to Mofsez Sultanian Mofsez Sultanian's mother Herine who was a Daratsi she actually ran this and the building next to the compound as the so-called Armenian Hotel. And it was the first hotel in Nicosia, as opposed to the various inns that used to exist. Now, Herine married Kevork uh, Sultanian, who was from Tokat. And then it was also known as uh, Sultanian Hotel. Mm -hmm. So, and he donated this uh, to uh, the AGBU. Now, on the other side of the compound, which is the Notre Dame de Deer Street, uh, there was the Armenian Club. Now, this Armenian Club, which was established in uh, 1902, yes, 1902, was actually the building was donated by Hanemi Yeramian of the well-known family from Deftera. And, uh, you know, it was uh, the first club of the community and actually one of the first social clubs in Nicosia. Um, further down the road on Victoria Street, at a point, there was the Ima Club. And uh, later on, it moved to the other side towards the Paris, Paris to, uh, towards the, the walls. Now, uh, there were also a series of houses, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are 21 that belonged to the church, you know, through donations, uh, gedags and so on. And, uh, you know, the church was renting them or even uh, giving them to people in need. And right next to uh, the Armenian club was uh, the old poor people's home, uh, Kadanots it used to be called, uh, and this was actually the house of uh, Simeon Aga of Crimea, Khimitsi, who was related through marriage to Khairabed Melikian, and Khairabed Melikian was the father of Artinbe Melikian, and Khairabed was originally from Githrea. So, and they were very affluent families. Uh, and this was, uh, I mean, after World War II, mainly, it was used to house, you know, old people, uh, people who were in need of housing and so on. And um, everywhere around the church and the compound, not just uh, Victoria Street, you, you could hear Armenian in the street. Uh, you know, when I went in 2019 for a conference to Burj Hamut, I, I actually went to the Haigazian, but we passed by Burj Hamut. I was impressed that you could hear Armenian in the street. So, uh, you know, and, you know, everything was so uh, close, neat, and everyone knew everyone, and so on. And uh, then... Similar uh, to what it was in Victoria Street. Yeah, and uh, I was talking actually about Victoria Street now. And then 1963-1964 happens. Uh, it was the intercommunal troubles. And uh, one of the first places that the Turkish Cypriots went to get was in fact the Armenian Quarter. And uh, an interesting fact, um, you posted a video a few days before uh, about uh, it, was, it was Levon Sarian and uh, Mofsez al -Majian, and they were talking about, you know, the area there. And Mofsez al mentioned 
that Koharik Shahinian, who was a daughter of the first priest whose name we know from Constantinople, he she had fifteen or six, fifty or sixty cats. Uh, he soon got from Gadu. Now, interesting fact and very sad. When the conflict happened, she refused to leave her house, and she stayed there. And because of all those cats, and because nobody could bring her food, because she was right in the middle, uh, when uh, they could approach the area, they discovered her body okay. had been eaten by her cats. Imagine that. Imagine that. So, uh, 63, 64 happens, uh, and people, uh, they have to leave their houses because of the Turks, and because they were fanatic, it's not, it's not every Turkish Cypriot, they were fanatical TMT, uh, led by Ankara and so on, mm -hmm. and they have to leave their homes. Uh, I know a case of uh, a family, they went to a wedding, which was at the Lidra Palace, and they couldn't go back to their house. Can you imagine that? Yeah. They couldn't go back to their house. So, um, and after that, uh, there is a collective trauma, I would say. There is a gap, a, a hole in the Armenian Cypriot psyche of Nicosia. And uh, now, the, you know, over. It is interesting, let me interrupt you, um, Alexander, that uh, it was a uh, Turkish Cypriot team mm -hmm. who um, created and um, uh, prepared a video about those yes. times. Uh, and our friend Mine Balman and uh, Besim, Besim Baisal. So they created a documentary called Birlikte. Miasin together, Mazi, and uh, the original language was Turkish, uh, but we made subtitles in English and Greek, and uh, they exposed and they revealed uh, this trauma. Because and the we, circumstances under which yes. the Armenian community of that area was forcefully expelled. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you, you couldn't go, you couldn't stay, and you had to go. There was no option. Yeah. So, and... Uh, I remember the most important thing in that documentary was the fact that Turkish Cypriots were um, telling the story of how peacefully Armenian Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots lived together, and how all this uh, was broken. And uh, in that hall that you mentioned, I remember, when we first showed the documentary, there were several Turkish Cypriots who uh, came out yeah. and apologized on behalf of the Turkish Cypriot but it's community. Not their fault. It's not their Definitely fault. not. Yes. Yeah. So and uh, now over time, the church, uh, as of '64, it was used by the Turkish Cypriot militia. Then after the invasion '74, it was used by the Turkish military until there was an earthquake in 1998. Now, when this earthquake happened, uh, there was damage to the building. Mm -hmm. So the military left and some settlers settled, to use a pun intended, settled there. Now, these people, they were from Anatolia. I don't know if they were Turkish or Kurdish. Uh, and they lived there until late 2006, early 2007. Now, uh, over this time, around 2005, uh, there was an, a feasibility uh, a study conducted for the potential restoration of the uh, project, of the, um, of the compound, as part of the Nicosia Master Plan, which was uh, on, undertaken by the UNDP Act. It was actually one of the last restorations by the UNDP Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was finally restored between 2009-2012. And on the 11th of May, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken correctly, on the 11th of May 2014, Archbishop Varujan Hergelian, just a few days before he left the island, he uh, reconsecrated uh, the cathedral 
and held the first Padarak, the first liturgy after uh, si 60 years, right? Mm -hmm. 64? Yes. No, 50 years. 50 years. Then, then 50, 50 years. years. 50 so, years now. And uh, well, yeah, afterwards, uh, there were uh, liturgies uh, held by Dermomig and uh, also a priest called Ohan Lusararian. Uh, this was under the auspices of um, Archbishop Nareg. And uh, so far, uh, our Sepazan, Archbishop Horen Doramajian, has performed three liturgies, has celebrated three liturgies. Uh, on the 16th of December 2018, on the 28th of November 2021, and uh, here we will do the third one on the 7th. But well, let's hope for many more. Alexander, we've passed the uh, 20 minute mark. I don't want to make this a little uh, longer. So we'll put an end to this interview, and uh, I would like to welcome you. Uh, we'll put a semicolon. A semicolon, okay. Mm -hmm. And when we come back from uh, the Divine Liturgy on Sunday, we will come and share our experiences yes. once again. Thank you, and I hope people go on Sunday. Because we need to be there, we need to show our presence, we need to claim what is ours. Thank you, Alexander, once again. You're welcome.